My name's Kevin Pilch. Uh, I work at Microsoft. I've been there for uh, coming up on 16 years next month. Um, I've spent that whole time working on the C Sharp team. Uh, so I started working just after we shipped uh, the original Visual Studio 2002. Um, I've worked on 2003, 2005, 8, 10, 12, 13, 15, 17. And now we're starting to work on, on VS 2019. Uh, in that time, I've kind of worked uh, mostly on what we call the IDE, or the productivity, or the language service team, uh, building features like uh, statement completion, formatting, syntax highlighting, refactoring, so all that kind of stuff has been what I've mostly done. Um, and then lately, I've kind of branched out, and I've been doing uh, project system, some of the .NET tooling around .NET Core, the .NET CLI and stuff, uh, and our, our online try C Sharp in the browser thing, try.net. So that's kind of uh, what I work on. I dabble a little bit in language design. Every couple months, I sit in with the language design team and talk about what they've been working on and where the language is going to go. Today, uh, we're going to spend most of the day in Visual Studio. I have, uh, I think, eight slides or so, but mostly they're just recap of the stuff that I want to kind of show you in Visual Studio. So I'm going to spend the majority of the day kind of directly in Visual Studio going through stuff. Uh, before we get started, how many people are using Visual Studio 2017 already? Just about everybody. Fantastic. How many people are kind of on the latest updates of it? Uh, great. How many people use the preview channel? Four. All right. I'm not counting you, Dustin. Uh, Dustin is one of my coworkers. He's sitting in the back there, too. Um, so. Uh, one thing I wanted to start out with is kind of this idea of the, the preview channel. So I'm going to switch over here to Parallels. And here you can see my Visual Studio has this big preview. Oh, you can't see. You can't see the title bar. Um, my Visual Studio has a, a big thing in the title bar that says Preview. There, you, now you can see it. And so if I click on this, it takes me to Help About. And it tells me that I'm in, I'm in the internal preview channel, but we also have a public preview channel. Uh, and anyway, the, the idea of the preview channel is that you can actually have two Visual Studios installed side by side. They don't interfere with each other. And the preview channel gets updates a few months ahead of what's going to come in the release channel. So you can have a chance to try it out, give us feedback, let us know how those features that we're working on work. Oh, thank you. Careful. Um, how those features work. Uh, and so we can kind of get some feedback on how they're working before they ship. And like I said, because it can be installed side by side and doesn't interfere with the other one, if you do run into any problems with it, you can kind of fall back and use the released version. So I would encourage people to go ahead and install the preview channel and try it out. So this is on uh, Visual Studio 15.8 Preview 4, uh, which came out on Tuesday. Uh, so those are the, the bits that I'm going to be using today, uh, plus a couple of extensions, uh, one of which is not quite public yet, uh, at least the version I'm using. But uh, I'll, I'll point out that part when, when we get to it. Um, so I, I mentioned the preview channel. I mentioned getting feedback from you guys. One way that we get feedback from you guys is when you click on the little uh, send feedback thing and you tell us about incidents. Right? That's one great source of feedback for us. Uh, but we also collect telemetry when you're using Visual Studio. We collect things like, when does it crash? How long do certain operations take? Is it responsive? Like, is the UI thread responding, or is it in that kind of frosted over, ghosted state where it's not responding? Uh, we collect all of that telemetry, and we collect what are the call stacks and stuff like that, so that we can try to address those issues. And that's another reason why we like it when you're on the preview channel, because then we can try to address those before they get into the, the released product. Um, based on that, we have done a ton of investment in uh, performance, reliability of Visual Studio. So at this point, uh, when it comes to reliability, we track it very closely, release over release. Uh, we track crashes, hangs, uh, what we call abnormal shutdowns, which is when you kill it with Task Manager, uh, and operating system restarts. And all of those are down significantly from VS 2015. And in fact, between 2017, like version 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, it's continued to drop across all of those metrics as we've fixed kind of those top issues that are impacting you guys. Uh, I mentioned kind of the, the UI responsiveness piece. We also tackle a bunch of the top ones of those. And so we've been fixing 
uh, a bunch of the top issues where Visual Studio is not responsive, and so it's been getting better. I'll try to show some examples of that today as we go through. I'm not working with a, a giant solution today, and so some of them are not as obvious. Uh, but I'll go ahead and start by opening the solution. Um, and so open solution, again, we collect telemetry on how long that takes. Uh, this one you could see took about two seconds. Our goal is for it to take about to take under 10 seconds. And right now, we're at that point for about 40% of the time when people open a solution. Uh, we're trying to get that faster, obviously. Uh, the, like, the other metric we track for that is, is the P95. What's the 95th percentile of solution open? And for a C-sharp project, that's around 50 seconds. Uh, but it turns out that between 15.3 and 15.8, where we've started working on this, that's actually dropped in half. Right? So that's the kind of investment that we've been making in performance. So like I said, this is a small solution. It opened in one or two seconds. But on your larger solutions, uh, we've done a lot of work to make them open a lot faster. Uh, the other thing that we've been working on related to performance uh, and memory usage and resource consumption is the idea of things being uh, uh, pay to play. Right? So we try not to start any work unless you show some indication that you're going to use that work. So the next feature that I'm going to look at is the Test Explorer. Uh, and so Test Explorer used to kind of proactively populate itself. Now it waits until I activate the window. But you can see that uh, the population is now done, first of all, without me having to do a build. And second of all, we just discovered a little over 5,000 tests in that one or two seconds. Right? So we now do the, the discovery based on source immediately. And we do it way faster than we ever have before. The other piece that we've built in here is a hierarchical test view. So I have this little toolbar checked. Uh, and that means that I'm now broken down by classes, names, or projects, namespaces, classes, et cetera. Uh, and you can see that through even the large generated ones. If I say run all, uh, we also put kind of more responsive feedback in here. So once it starts running, the build just finished, you can now see that we have kind of the clock icon saying what's been running, what's in progress right now, what's failed. So you kind of have a better idea of what's going on during a unit test run. And we'll give them a few more seconds to run. We're just about done. So there we ran our 5,000 tests. Uh, a lot of them failed. We're going to ignore most of them for the rest of this talk. We're going to kind of focus on these ones in here. So this solution that I opened, I didn't talk about what it is. Uh, the solution is an Alexa skill. Uh, that interacts with the Seattle transit system so that I can get up and ask Alexa what time my bus is going to come. Right, so that's the idea of it, is we use the, the REST APIs that the uh, King County Metro Transit offers for us. So uh, we've got these six little unit tests here. A couple of them are failing. Let's take a look and, and see what we can find about what's going on there. So I'm going to start debugging this first test. So I'll just right click and say debug selected tests. And it'll get going here in a second. And we'll hit a breakpoint that I had already set somewhere in the code related to this. And uh, again, on that UI delay performance thing, one of the things that we've worked on a lot is the performance of stepping in Visual Studio. And so a bunch of features that used to cause stepping to get slower, like painting the call stack window, figuring out what's in the autos window, and all that stuff. We've made a bunch of that stuff be asynchronous and not block you stepping anymore. So if you step again, it'll just cancel all of its evaluations and start again at the next step. Uh, so that can, can let you go a little bit faster. So you, know, you can step through with things like F10 and F11 like you always have. Uh, but one of my favorite recent features in the debugger, for those who haven't seen it, is uh, this idea of run to cursor. How many people like find somewhere they want to get to, set a breakpoint, they press F5, they get there, they get rid of the breakpoint? Yeah, I see, see one hand up. So one of the features that we've added recently is this little uh, thing that appears underneath the cursor to the left of the line of code. And I can just click it. And basically, it does that for you. It sets a breakpoint, runs to there, and then clears the breakpoint. And so you can just say run to cursor wherever you want to run. So I'm looking at this code right here. Uh, and it's a little bit complicated. Some of it comes from a library. Some of it is my code. Some of it is link, query, link uh, methods. So we've added a few things in the IDE to help out there. One of those is 
uh, the idea that if you hover over, oh, we can't do it when we're debugging. We'll come back to this one. Anyway, let's, uh, let's look at this method right here. This method right here comes from a library that I got on NuGet, right? So if I look at my solution, I have a dependency on this bus helpers library that I got from NuGet. So I'm worried that the reason that this test is failing is because of something that's in this method. I'm worried that it's not doing the right thing. So I want to know what this method does. So one of the things that we've built into Visual Studio now, and it's off by default because it's still a little bit of an experiment, so you have to enable it in tools options. Uh, but we've integrated the uh, ILSpy decompiler into our go to definition code. So if I just hit F12, or if I yeah, hit F12 and go to definition, I get a big scary warning that our lawyers made us put there that says you're looking at somebody else's code. Uh, you see that once per DLL per, per solution, so it's not like every time you do it. Um, so yes, you're going to see somebody else's code. Uh, and we'll go ahead and decompile that code and show you the C-sharp representation of it, whereas we used to just show you kind of what the method signatures look like. Um, you can see that like, the decompiler doesn't always understand all of the language. And so it's hard to know exactly what this method is doing. How did the decompiler do? So let's go back over here. And instead of that, I'm going to set a breakpoint directly on this expression and run to it. And then I'm going to step into this method with F11. And I get a different scary dialog. Uh, but this time, this is a DLL that has been compiled, and it the, the NuGet package embeds the source information for this library. And so this is an open source library. The code lives on GitHub. Uh, and the NuGet package has what version, commit hash, and URL, and project, and everything in the NuGet package. And the debugger recognizes that. And I can say download and continue debugging. And if the network is working in here today, we'll get the actual source code that it found, including the comments and everything like that. So this is the exact code that was used to build this DLL. Uh, so this is a feature that will work for open source libraries. Like I said, uh, when the authors of those libraries choose to include that source link information, which we've made it pretty easy to do. You basically just have to, in, in your own library, reference a NuGet package to pull that in and set a few properties in your project. So we'll do that for kind of all of our .NET open source libraries. I would encourage any of you who are open source developers who have your own libraries to take a look at SourceLink and making that information available for consumers of, of your libraries. So now we're like actually in the method. I can step through like I, like I could before. And it looks like this method's actually OK. So let's step back out of it. Uh, not Shift F12, Shift F11 and come down here and see kind of what else is going on. So we're going to add this list of times. And hovering over this, it's pretty hard to see. I didn't adjust that font. Uh, we can see that the total minutes is actually a, a fractional value. So it's 8.78333333. 8 and we actually wanted it to be kind of the whole minute time. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to select the code uh, here, while I'm still debugging, and I'm going to use control dot to introduce a local. And so I can just do this little refactoring. It doesn't matter that I'm debugging, whatever. Uh, and we pop you into our inline rename experience. Uh, we kind of pick a good name for you, which I accidentally deleted. Um, and so now I've got this local, and I can put in a math.round. And I went around to zero decimal places. And you can see my, my carrot is kind of sitting down here. Um, I can step we, with F10. So that just applied those changes. This code is now recompiled on the fly while I'm still debugging. And you can see that I added uh, that value from before I made that change into, the, uh, into this collection. So I'm going to use the immediate window which is kind of a, an, a window that's been there for a long time that a lot of people don't know about. But that lets you just kind of type in code and execute it in the context of the current debugger. So I'm going to use time until dot clear to get rid of that value. 
And then, so now time until is empty. And then I'm going to take this instruction pointer, this little yellow thing, and I'm just going to drag it back up to the top and say, start from here now. Forget where you were, go back where you, where, to this line of code, and let's run this bit again now that I've changed it. And so now I'll just hit F5 and clear the breakpoint back here. And we'll see the test finishes running. This time it passes. I know it's kind of hard to see uh, on that screen because the projector is a little uh, low in contrast. Um, but actually, the test that just ran is kind of a normal set of colors. All these tests that ran in a previous test run, they're kind of faded out. Uh, and so we used to kind of reorder the list, and you couldn't find things. So now we keep it sorted alphabetically. Uh, but the test results that are from a previous run that aren't the most current results, they're kind of faded out. So you can tell whether they're, they're stale or not. All right. So at this point, we fixed one test. Uh, but we still have this other one, the test get arrivals. Null is still failing. So I'm going to double click on that to navigate to it. Uh, and I'm looking at code lens right here. And code lens tells me that, uh, that I'm the one that changed this method. So uh, my plan at this point was that I was going to uh, phone a friend and see if I could get them to help me fix it. Uh, unfortunately, that friend is me. So I'm still going to go through this, because there's something I want to show you here. Um, so what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to use the new uh, Visual Studio Live Share feature. So this is generally made for collaborating with other people. Uh, I'm going to do it with myself, just as an example today. And so I've installed an extension, the Visual Studio Live Share extension. And I can click Share up here. And when I click Share, it's going to ask me to authorize, like to, to sign in so I have an identity. I'll sign in with my GitHub, and I can close this. And you can see this little yellow bar says, I copied an invite link to your clipboard. You can share it with whoever you want to kind of join into your session. So at this point, I'm going to flip over to my Mac, where I have Visual Studio Code running. And I'm going to click on the little Share button down here or on my little name down here. And I can join a collaboration session. And it pre-populates this with the link that's already on my clipboard. So I can hit Enter. And what will happen now is Visual Studio Code is going to stream down the state of my session from the other machine, from the virtual machine where I'm running Visual Studio in parallels. Uh, and you can see that now I've got kind of uh, the set of files. I've got the file that's open. You can see the yellow mark here is where my cursor is in the other instance of Visual Studio. So you can imagine if you're doing pair programming with a remote developer or this kind of case where somebody else is the expert on the code, uh, they can use their own environment. They can use the tools that they're comfortable with, and they can share the code with you instead of kind of, oh, you know, press F10 now and, and like trying to talk to each other or using kind of uh, slower, higher bandwidth screen sharing sessions. So I'm going to come back over here into the host. And uh, at this point, you know, we've been working with tests for a little while. I'm going to show you kind of a way to automate a bunch of what we've been doing in the tests. And so in VS, the Enterprise Edition, there's this menu up here that's called Live Unit Testing. And I'm just going to go ahead and hit Start. And you'll see that another kind of margin appears on the left over here. We'll hide that. And soon, there's a little task center telling us that it's doing stuff. Live unit testing is running some tests. So there we go. Now it's done. And you can see along the left margin, there's a bunch of new icons along the left margin. And what those tell me is what the, this line of code is covered by a passing test if it's a green check mark. It's covered by a failing test if it's covered by a red X. And these are tests so you don't see it, but it'll be covered by a blue line uh, if it's not covered by any tests at all. And we'll, we'll take a look at that a little bit later. Uh, this says that it's a test, it's a, a test method. Um, if I click on it, I can see kind of the list of tests that cover it. I can run them or debug them. I can hover over one of those particular tests, and I can see what the, the output from the test is. Yes. Sorry, I had a question in the back. So the question is, does this work with NUnit and non-Microsoft tests? 
Uh, it does. Uh, it works with anything that integrates into Test Explorer. Um, we provide out of the box integration for n unit, x unit, and MS test. Um, so, great question. Absolutely. Uh, so, there we go. Um, kind of this will update live whenever I make a change and give us the status of those tests. It's smart enough not to rerun all of those 5,000 tests. What it did is while it collected that coverage information, it kept track of what method was covering what line. And so as I change some code, it'll rerun only those tests that are affected by, by the lines of code that I change. So where am I in my list of things to do? Um, so the next thing that I want to do is I'm going to start debugging this test. So let's do it from here. I'll debug the selected test. And you can see, once it finishes building again, uh, you can see that we've started debugging. We're hitting a breakpoint. But it also started debugging in the sharing session that I have with Visual Studio Code. And now either developer on either side can step. So I can go ahead and step here, and you can see that it stepped. If I come back over here, it stepped over here. So we're actually attached to the same debugging session. My little uh, locals window up here, I can see all the state of the debugger that's running. Uh, it doesn't matter that it's a different machine. And I've heard of people doing this uh, across continents, um, across offices down the hall, when people are too lazy to, to walk down the hall, um, on the same machine in front of a crowd. right? Uh, so wherever you want to use this, it can, can kind of really help you collaborate with people. So I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and just keep stepping and see what happens. Uh, and ah, we hit a null reference exception. That didn't work the way that I wanted it to. Um, so we were supposed to hit the exception helper that tells you that there's a, a null reference exception and what exact variable is null. And I'm not sure why we didn't today. Uh, but I'm not going to spend too much time on it. So let's imagine that we did that. Uh, and so we should be in this validate latitude longitude method. You can see that what happened is we passed null in, and we immediately go through and hit length. And so we had a null reference exception. And it should tell us exactly what variable is. But like I said, I'm not sure why it didn't. So one of the things that we added uh, kind of in editor productivity is we've been adding a bunch of these little uh, quick fixes, little things to generate a little bit of code for you, change it around, make your flow a little bit easier for kind of all the boilerplate tasks that you do. And so one task that we know people do a lot is check for null. And so I can just go ahead and put my cursor on a parameter, click control dot, and one of the options I have is add a null check for that. That'll throw an argument exception. Or I, because we know that string is a special type and it's not just null that we worry about, you can also add null or empty or null or white space checks. We kind of have that built in for, for string. So I'm going to go ahead and add the null check here. And you can see that uh, the, the live unit testing stuff got that little arrow, or got the little time delay the little clock on it that says the results are stale and we're recalculating. And now it's updated, and the test passed now. So we just fixed that test, live unit testing, reran the test, and showed it us that it was fixed. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and end the sharing session now, uh, which I can do at any time. And when I do, um, I get a message over here that says the owners ended it. And so kind of my rights to that session is gone now. Everything's cleaned up off my local machine. I don't have any of that source code anymore. Question over here? Right. Uh, there is not a way to, to remote the UI yet. Sorry, the, the question was, uh, if you're debugging a UI application, is there a way to share the UI so that the other person can see? Um, there isn't today. Uh, is it on the roadmap? I don't know, but I can follow up and find out. I'm not sure. Great question, though. Um, so coming back over here, uh, what do I want to look at next? Um, so the next thing is, while actually using this Alexa skill, uh, I noticed that it's giving me a time, but it's not giving me 
the time for the stop that's closest to where I live. It's just giving me, it seems like kind of a random time. And so I want to go take a look at that, even though all of our tests are, are passing. And so I'm going to use uh, the go to feature, control T, which is kind of go to anything that I, I want to go to. And I'm just going to type get, lo get loc in here. And this will do a fuzzy match for everything that it concludes, get loc. Uh, and it'll weight things higher based on uh, word breaks, right? When you use camel case words. And so you can see the bold matches in kind of these things that matched. And these are methods and classes and files. All those things kind of get matched automatically. And you can go ahead and, and actually filter them. So you can do stuff like M to say, only show me the members. Or you can say T and say, only show me the types. Well, there aren't any. Or F for files and so on. So we wanted to go uh, to this get root and stops for location. So I'm going to double click that. And once I get here, um, if I take a look through this, I said you know we were kind of only getting uh, a random stop. Well, it turns out it's not actually random. It's just the first stop that was returned. Uh, we didn't do any calculation to figure out what's the nearest stop. So let's get rid of this code. We'll comment it out using uh, Control K, Control C, and then we'll write some more code. So let's say we want uh, the minimum. And that'll be uh, from stop in stops select. We'll add a new helper method here to calculate the distance uh, between stop.lat and lat and stop.longitude and longitude. And we'll take the dot min of those. Uh, so I can see I don't actually have this method here, so I'm going to just use control dot to generate it. And it'll make an error go away, and I kind of won't worry about it for now. Uh, oh, I didn't quite make the error go away, so let's go look and see what's going on. If I control, I, that went too fast for you to see. If I hold down control, uh, one of the things that we've added is uh, that the identifiers, it's not showing it. Um, will end up looking like hyperlinks, and I can click on them to do, invoke go to definition. So uh, you know, if you're just kind of navigating through code, if you're not a keyboard person that's you know, used to hitting F12 all the time, control click works kind of the way you would expect it to. So I think the problem here is that this thing returns an object, and I want it to return a double. So I'm just going to change that, and I'm going to go back and not really worry about it right now, and fill in the second half of this which is going to be that stop, stop equals uh, stops dot where, stop. This is probably not the fastest way to do this, uh, but it's good enough for this app. We can worry about the performance later. So let's find the one that equals that minimum that we just calculated, and we'll take the first one out of there. All right. Uh, I still have an error over here. Oh, my link. Yeah, I need another paren there. There we go. Nearly. Uh, this should be. This is why I should have copied and pasted this code in. Anyway, uh, so now we have this kind of code kind of working, or looks the way we want it to, but it's kind of hard to understand. Uh, I'm not particularly great on uh, link query syntax, the froms and selects and stuff like that, uh, as you can see. Uh, so I'm going to actually just select this code right to the end of the link query. And I'm going to hit that handy control dot again. You can see a little screwdriver icon. Uh, over here in the margin, that tells me uh, the ID can help me do something with this selection. Uh, what can it help me do? Well, I'll hit Control dot to see. And it can either extract that into a method, or I can convert that into a for each. And so I can go ahead and hit Enter, and it will just change that link query into a for each statement that has the equivalent set of code. And maybe I actually don't even want to use uh, a for each, 
maybe I want to use a four, right? So I can control dot on this for each, and it'll actually offer to change it to the equivalent four, and I can, uh, ah, I can use, sorry, uh, I don't know what I've done now. I, I think it's, uh, so I'll, I'll make a confession. I use uh, the visvim extension uh, to give vim key bindings, and it doesn't always interact very well with our, our rename experience. Um, so anyway, I can uh, convert that for into a for each. I can convert that link query into a for. Uh, the one that we don't have quite yet is we don't have uh, link queries to the extension method syntax and back. Uh, but we're working on those, and then hopefully they'll show up in a, in a future update. In this case, I'm going to go back uh, and leave it kind of as the, the link query, because I actually think that's easier than, than the code that we generated there. The one other thing I wanted to show here is I can hover over this, uh, this uh, arrow that indicates that this is a lambda expression. And one of the things that we've added recently is that second line of output there that I know is hard to read. But what it says is, Variables captured. And so now, if you're someone who's interested in, am I closing over any variables? Am I going to be allocating any, any stack objects or anything like that to store the state? St um, yes, you can find that out kind of now directly in the IDE. We just make that available in the, the tooltip there. But you might have to know to hover over that arrow. All right, let's head down here to calculate distance and see what's going on. Uh, so here, I've got. Um, it generated a method. My style settings say to generate it with uh, expression-bodied members, if possible. Uh, and, but I don't really want this one to be. So again, control dot. I can just say, no, I don't want it to be in that style. Uh, even though that's kind of my default preference, we still offer you a refactoring to change it to, and to the other style in a bunch of cases. So I'll change it to be a method uh, with, with braces. And then I'm going to use uh, our change signature feature and just kind of line these up so that the types are the same, because some of them are, are different. Right? So I'll put the two double ones first and the two string ones later. Uh, and so that's gone and fixed my call sites and updated them so that the order is the way that we want it to be. And now I have it the way that I want it to be down here. Let's think about implementing this method. So we'll get rid of that exception. And let's say var distance equals math dot. Uh, and so you can see here uh, in completion something that a bunch of you may not have seen before. Uh, there's kind of a bunch of stars beside some of the members. And those are not the alphabetically sorted set of members. And the reason why that's there is that I've installed the, the Visual Studio IntelliCode uh, extension, which is a preview extension that we have up there right now. And IntelliCode uses machine learning to suggest the most frequently used members. So it's been trained on over 5,000 open source repositories. To, so it kind of has a sense of when people are using the math class, these are the methods that they're most likely to use in a math class. Uh, but it's, it goes a little bit beyond that, because it takes into account whatever kind of context it can get from your current program, uh, like kind of local syntactic stuff. And so if I change this var to be a double, and I do that again. You can see now, if I do math and I want the result to be a double, the most common thing people do there is use the square root function. And, and so we actually flow in that context. We flow in stuff like whether you're in a loop, a for, an if statement, that sort of thing. And then, like we said, it's been kind of trained on a large body of open source code. So let's go ahead and implement this method. Uh, if I can remember my Cartesian coordinate stuff. Uh, it's probably lat1 minus uh, convert to double. Uh, lat2. Uh, oh, no, I need a math.pow in here, because it's going to be the square of those differences. Uh, plus. So next feature I want to show you is I can now kind of select some code. Uh, and I can use Control D to just duplicate that code, whatever I have selected. If I don't have a selection, uh, it'll just do the current line. So I'm going to put this plus in here. Oh, I need a 2. 
that's what I wanted. And now we'll do this with the longe. Longitude. Whew. All right. And we'll return this guy. And hopefully our tests will start to pass. So uh, looking over here at Test Explorer, now all of our tests are passing. Uh, I think I just changed the behavior of the program, though, but it doesn't look like we have a test to cover it. So I want to do kind of a little bit of ad hoc experimentation to look at what's kind of going on right now. And so to do that, I'm going to select this method that I just added, and let, we're going to play with it a little bit. So I'm going to use Control-E, Control-E to execute that code in the C-sharp interactive window. And so I don't know how many people have played with the C-sharp interactive window. We added it a while ago. Uh, but but a lot of, not a lot of people know about it. But the C-sharp interactive window is this little tool window where you can just kind of type in C-sharp code and use it, kind of play with it, see what happens. So I just added this method to it. I'm going to grab some code uh, that I want to play with, if I can see where it is. And we'll define some coordinates. So I'll go ahead and paste this. Hit enter, and so now I've kind of got code, some code set up. What we wanted to look at was that method that we just added. So if I just type calculate distance, uh, so first of all, I get completion based on the fact that I've defined this method right here in the, the interactive window. So I can calculate distance, and let's do the convention center uh, dot lat and uh, my stop dot lat. I think we did this wrong, didn't we? Uh, and then convention center dot long and my stop dot longitude. Uh, yeah. So I put those in the wrong order. Sorry when I did my reorder parameters up above. I think I wanted to reorder it this way. Um, so anyway, so I can fill this in. What it, what's going on? Oh, my stop.lon. OK. Sorry. Thank you for the help. And then we'll do convention center. No. This is lawn. All right. I'm getting there slowly. Convention center. Wait. All right. Thank you. Ah. There we go. All right. So now I have something that looks like it'll compile. Uh, I'm somewhere in the middle of this line. Uh, so I can hit Enter, and that allows me to enter a multi-line thing. Uh, but if I didn't actually want a multi-line thing, I can hit Control-Enter to just say, go ahead and execute this from where I am. So uh, I've calculated this. It's, it's 0 0.0023. Um, so let's try that new stop that, uh, that we wanted to look at that I defined up above. So I'll use Alt-Up to go th scroll through the history as if you were on kind of a terminal command prompt. But because we allow multi-line input, uh, up and down don't work very well. So we use Alt-Up and Alt-Down. Um, so I can go ahead and use New Stop here, New Stop here, Control-Enter since I'm not at the beginning. And we can see the New Stop is actually closer than the old stop. Uh, so now at this point, we've added the code. We think it should work. We should probably add a test. Uh, but I'm running out of time. And uh, we all know we don't always add tests when we should. Uh, so let's just go ahead and check in. So I'm going to click on the status bar down here, this little 2. This is kind of my git status that VS is just kind of always telling me what my status is. It says I've got two files changed, and I'm uh, current with my, with my upstream. Uh, so if I click on it, it shows me what the two files are. I can click on them and see their changes. Uh, so compare with unmodified. We'll come up here. It'll show me what code I've just added. 
Uh, but I can just go ahead and say, let's uh, fix some um, tests and bugs and commit. Uh, so this is another place where we've done a lot of work around performance uh, is around the Git integration. And so part of the work we did around solution load is making sure that the Git status kind of gets out of your way a little bit. Another big area of focus for us recently has been around uh, switching branches. Uh, it turns out that Visual Studio's code for switching branches uh, was mostly written when Visual Source Safe uh, was the, the source control system du jour. And people didn't switch branches very often. And so you know, we didn't spend a lot of time and energy making switching branches be particularly fast. Uh, so what ended up happening is if you change a project file, we have to reevaluate a bunch of stuff in the project file. And so that was pretty slow. We did some work to make that faster, but that was pretty slow. Turned out that if you had a big solution with projects referencing other projects, then we would do it for one project, and then that would invalidate all the other projects, and we would do it for the other project. And so we would do this kind of n squared reevaluation of the whole world. Right? And that was kind of the state of things in VS 2013 and, and before. Uh, and so in VS 2015, one of the updates, I forget which one now, uh, we did the cheapest thing we could possibly do, which is we said, instead of doing an n squared reload of all the projects, Let's just reload the solution. We'll just throw everything away, and we'll really reload the solution for you. And that's a little bit better, because at least it's not n squared anymore. At least it's only n. Uh, but over the last few, uh, few updates, most of the work is going to be coming in this 15.8 update. What we actually did instead is fix the reloads to happen in order instead of being n squared, uh, and optimize them. So you should see reloading projects, and in particular, when you switch branches, uh, that should happen a lot more quickly now. The last thing we did is <coughs> uh, we kind of took advantage of the fact that if you switch branches from inside Visual Studio, the Visual Studio knows that you're switching branches. So we have kind of a lot of stuff that watches the file system to see if any files change on disk. Uh, so that if you drop to the command line and do a git operation or something like that, VS will catch up with you. But it turns out that all of that stuff was running and fighting with you while you were switching inside Visual Studio. Because it was just like, oh my god, a thousand files just changed. I better start parsing everything and doing everything. So now we have kind of a, a back off approach where we say, we're going to do a branch switch. The file system's going to change a lot. Just hold on. We'll tell you when, you're done, when we're done. And then you can go update stuff. And so. Uh, 15.8, uh, again, another reason to try out the preview, but your, your branch switch experience should be a lot better in 15.8. All right, where are we? Uh, the question is, what kind of Git visualization tools do we have planned? Uh, and I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that. Uh, the Git team is mostly uh, over in Raleigh, uh, and so I don't hear from them all that often. But, uh, but if you want to follow up with me after, where I can get you in touch with the right people. There's another question over here. Sure. So the question is, uh, so far I've been showing kind of IDE level Visual Studio features. Uh, but uh, an astute observer has noticed that we've added uh, language features and updates for C Sharp, right? So we now have C Sharp 7.1 and 7.2. And Dustin's talk this afternoon, we'll talk a lot more about that stuff. But the, the question was, I said we have side-by-side -side previews. Uh, can that cause problems between your different, uh, different environments? If some people update to a preview, or the developers do, but your, your build system doesn't on your CI, CD system. Um, and so what's the, the story there? Uh, by default, unless you go out of your way to change it, uh, we default to the last major version of the C-sharp language. So we default to C-sharp 7 across all VS updates unless you go tell us not to. 
And you can tell us not to in one of two ways. You can say, I want to use C-sharp 7.2. And then no matter what update you get, you'll use C-sharp 7.2. Or you can say, I want to use the latest and greatest C-sharp that you've got, whatever's on your machine. If you choose the latter, then yes, you can get into this problem where machines have different states. right? But if you choose a specific version, if you choose the 7.2 or 7.3, then the preview won't add any new features that aren't that are as part of that 7.3 version. Does that help? OK. Um, let's look at this geocode helpers class. And uh, while we are here, I noticed my, uh, my scroll bar map view thing. Uh, how many people know about the map view in the scroll bar one? Um, so if you actually right click, there's a scroll bar options. Uh, and it'll take you to tools options. And you can say use bar or use map mode and what previews do you want and stuff. I quite like the map mode, personally. Uh, if you have a touch screen, it's particularly great because you can just tap where you want to go in the file, uh, and it'll go there kind of immediately. So I have these three kind of pink dots uh, that are really hard to see in the contrast up there. But on my machine, they're pink. By default, they're kind of a subtle gray color. Uh, but I wanted to, to make them pop out a little bit more. And you can see uh, this first one corresponds to this if statement, which has got these little pink dots underneath it. And what does that mean? Uh, so if I hover over it, it says I should add braces to an if statement. Uh, so we now have a code style option that says single line if statements should have braces. Uh, it's not on by default, but if you happen to believe correctly that single line if statements should have braces, <laughs> Uh, then you can go ahead and do that. So I can you know, hit control dot, and I can say add braces. Uh, no big deal. So let, I, but I didn't do it right now. right? So let's come up here and look at what the other ones are. The other ones are, uh, I used uh, double with a capital D. Um, and our style is set up to say, uh, use the, the keyword instead. So those are some style things there. Uh, what about over here on the left? One line says double, one line says var. Who's right? Who's wrong? Uh, we don't care. Uh, you, you decide. Um, we'll help you either way. And so you can see I don't have a style configured. And so if I hit control dot, it'll tell me I can use var instead of an explicit type. Uh, if I go to var and I hit control dot, uh, it'll say I can use an explicit type instead of var. Right? Whichever way you want to go, you can go that way. If you want to enforce a style, then by all means, you can enforce a style. And so you can do that at tools options, code style, blah, 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 blah. But you should never do that. Uh, instead, what you should do is you should add an editor config file to your repository. And editor config is kind of an open source standard for how you configure your editor. What are your tab sizes? What are your spaces? Does, should your, line, your files end with a new line or not? Uh, and so they had kind of six core properties. And they said, you can extend this for your editor and language. Uh, and so we did. And so we now kind of support this idea of an editor config that can specify how all of this stuff behaves. And so you know, should I have this dot before fields? Yes or no, like true or false in this case. And should that, how, how strong of a preference is that? Should I suggest it to the user with those little dots that I just had? Or should I make it a warning? Should I make it an error? Uh, it doesn't quite work yet, but it's coming. Uh, that when you make it an error, uh, that can actually, that will soon actually be able to break your build. So you can enforce that style on your CI CD system. Uh, right now, it's kind of an IDE only uh, visualization of the the errors, but but more is coming. Um, so in this case, I'm over here in GeoCode Helpers. I kind of want this to be. Uh, I want to have a style for var, but I don't want to pick. I don't have strong feelings on it. I want to kind of do the least changes to my code. Uh, so how do I find out what are the least changes to my code? Well, one of the things that uh, we're working on, and so this is in a preview version of the IntelliCode extension. So I told you before I was using the IntelliCode extension. I'm actually using a preview version of it. Uh, but if I come and pick this project, and right click and say, add new item. Uh, if I come in here and say, editor config, well, we now have 
two things in the box by default. We have kind of a .NET one that includes a bunch of the .NET specific properties, and we have a default one that includes kind of just the six core properties. Uh, but I also have this editor config file IntelliCode thing. Uh, and so that comes from the IntelliCode extension. And I'm going to click Add. And it says it may take a few minutes, uh, or it would say that if the line wrapped properly. Uh, in this code base, it doesn't take that long. But what happened here is we actually went and analyzed all of your code and generated an editor config file that most closely matches what your source code currently is. So if you mostly obey a common coding style today, we can figure out what that is. We can generate an editor config. And from now on, you can enforce it that that's the coding style that you want to have. So coming back over here into GeoCode Helpers, uh, if I pull up my error list, uh, that's something I didn't mention before. But my error list uh, also includes these suggestions. Uh, so whether I'm in, in suggestion or warning or error class, uh, my my error list can include those. So I've got you know seven of these in this file. I meant to show you before. Uh, before this, I only had those three. But now you can see I've kind of got more. So the editor config has inferred some stuff, and it's now we found some places where you are where we're not meeting that style. So I can you know click double click on each one of these, and then I can hit Control Dot, and I can fix it. Uh, but you can imagine that if I had a larger code base than this. That'd be pretty annoying to do for everyone in every file. And uh, it can be annoying to do all the time while you're coding. Sometimes you want to just get in the zone, you want to write a bunch of code, and you'll clean it up later. right? How many people get in the zone and don't worry about style very much? There, there's one. There's a few. We call it the Andy or the Tomash style, because there's definitely people on our team who give us feedback. Um, and so the other thing that we've added is that if I go to Tools Options, this is where I said you could configure this stuff, but you shouldn't. Um, if I go to Formatting here, we've added this new set of settings down here that say Format Document Settings. Uh, what extra style cleanups do you want us to run automatically for you whenever you do Format Document? And so this has got stuff like, I want you to sort my usings and remove the unnecessary ones. I want you to add those braces to if statements. I want you to change var to be explicit types, or vice versa. Um, and so we've kind of made some choices about what we think most people are, are likely to want there. Uh, there's more you can add. There's things that you can remove if, if you don't feel comfortable having us do that automatically. But if I just come back here and I do my Control-K, Control-D, or Control-E, Control-D to format document, uh, you can see we just fixed all of those seven style violations uh, that showed up in that file. Because as well as changing the white space of the code, we also fixed these kind of minor cosmetic style issues for you with a format document. OK, got eight minutes left. Uh, what am I going to work on? I guess I could do slides, but slides are kind of boring. So um, we're looking at the, the error list right now. Uh, you can see that I've got it filtered to the current document, but you can see that there's one warning somewhere. So let's flip this over to entire solution and see what that warning is. Uh, well, that warning is that this line of code is, is unreachable. It's unreachable code. It's kind of a minor thing, uh, but we started to fade out the unreachable code. And if you decide that you really uh, don't want the unreachable code, we've got a fix that will you know, delete it for you. It's not a super complicated fix, but, uh, but it's a handy little thing. So now that I'm in this file, uh, I want to take a look at kind of what's going on. So I've got, uh, let's close these for a little bit. I've got this thing that's handling HTTP status codes. Um, it's got kind of a bunch of ifs and else's and stuff like that. I'm not sure that it, how it looks like that. I think maybe a switch would be better. Uh, so my little screwdriver over here says the IDE can help me with something. Uh, one of the things it can help me with is that it can convert that if into a switch. All right, so I'll go ahead and do that. I think that looks a little bit nicer. It's a little clearer that it's handling some set of HTTP status codes. I feel like there's more than three, though. Uh, I'm not a really a network guy. I work mostly on Visual Studio. But I'm pretty sure there's more than three HTTP status codes. Uh, so we can also detect that you're switching on something like an enum. Uh, and we can offer to generate uh, the missing switch cases. So this is great if somebody adds additional things to an enum after the fact and you want to come fill them in. Uh, in this case, 
Uh, this is a little more work than I wanted to get into. I'm just going to dismiss this and not actually do it right now. Um, other little stuff we've got up here. I see another little style thing where I was using a, a capital uh, string, not the keyword version of string. And so you can see we've got a fix there. Uh, but I could, would rather just get rid of this whole thing. And so you can see this third fix that we've got down here is I can actually just convert that into an interpolated string. Um, so that we also have a bunch of these that let you kind of take advantage of some of the new language features, help make you aware of them. Um, again, uh, when it comes to the point releases, uh, we kind of tie these fixes into what language version you've elected to use in your project. So if you're not willing to use C Sharp 7.3 fixes or C Sharp 7.3 language features, we're not going to suggest that you change your code to take advantage of those C Sharp 7.3 language features. Um, so again, that should help avoid you getting into that situation where different machines have different settings. So I've got another one of these over here. Uh, that I'll make into a, uh, an interpolated string. Uh, this if statement, I've got kind of a guard clause here where I get a response and then I do a throw. I don't really like that. I think it might look better the other way around. And so we've added an invert if uh, refactoring. So if I've got an if with an else, it'll negate the condition and flip the cases around. So you know sometimes that's one of these things that you want to use on your way to something else. So in this case, I want to flip it around and then I want to delete this and delete this, and delete this, and put a var here. And so now I've got a kind of a guard clause instead of an if else. And so I can clean stuff up that way. Uh, last couple of things I wanted to show. We have a couple more uh, uh, suggestions up here. Uh, so here I've got this field, the HTTP client. It's got a suggestion on it. If I control dot, that suggestion says, the editor config file that we have says that you should always have the accessibility modifiers, even if they're using the default ones. Right? So this is an option that we can now enforce with editor config. Either you want to always have private or internal for types, or you never want to. But instead of kind of a mishmash of whoever typed it, uh, you can just kind of be consistent. So I can go ahead and fix that one. Uh, and we also do the same thing. We can enforce a standard ordering. Uh, we give you tons of flexibility. There's an editor config thing where you can like list all the keywords in the order that you would want them to appear in the modifiers. I don't know why you would ever change that. I think just take what we give you. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so we've got that option as well. So you can kind of enforce a consistent. And this just makes it easier to come into a code base and understand what the code is saying, whether it like to say, oh, it's got static before read only. So I never have to, like, once I see read only, I know it's not static anymore, right? These kinds of things. Uh, one last thing uh, in this file um, this guy has uh, the option to add a read only modifier. That's not configured in our editor config, and so it's not a suggestion, but we still, like I said, kind of make it a helpful thing. You can add it to the editor config. I forget which one of these it is. Uh, this one. Um, and the extension isn't updated yet to know about it, so it's not in completion. Uh, but I can say .NET read-only field uh, equals true. And let's say it's an error. If you have a field that could be read-only but isn't, um, I'll flip back over here. And if I got the syntax for that right, which it doesn't look like I did, uh, it should be an error unless I put it in the wrong one. Oh, it's .NET style. Uh, one other change for those of you who've dove into editor config before is that you used to have to restart, uh, close and open files, or restart things when you changed an editor config before they took effect. Uh, that bug is finally fixed. And so once I typed the name right, um, you can see this is now an error because this field could be read-only and isn't. So that's the kind of style thing that you can enforce. I think I'm going to stop right there, because uh, I have 45 seconds left. Um, let's see if there's anything I wanted to say in slides. I can put these slides up. Uh, solution load switching, unit testing. Uh, I didn't do expand contract selection. Uh, I didn't do go to virtual and abstract uh, with F12 on override. Ah. Bottom one's important. Coming in 15.8, uh, 
How many people in here use ReSharper? A bunch of you, all right. Um, so ReSharper is a great tool. We like it a lot. We like the value that it's added. Uh, we've been trying to make it so that people don't feel like they have to install ReSharper the first thing they do when they install Visual Studio. Uh, we also know from the telemetry that we get that ReSharper has a significant impact on the performance of your, your Visual Studio instance. And so we're trying to alleviate that, make you more productive without ReSharper. One thing we hear when we talk to people is, but I've been using ReSharper for 10 years, and I know all the keyboard shortcuts and everything like that, and so I just can't use VS. Uh, so 15.8, we're adding a ReSharper keyboard profile. So if you go to Tools, Options, Environment, Keyboard, there's like C Sharp, VB, C++, there'll be a ReSharper one in there. So you can give it a try. Uh, let us know how it goes. Uh, let us know what you're missing. Uh, when, when and if you go back to using ReSharper. A uh, bunch of quick fixes, a uh, bunch of language features and code style options, debugging. I think that's it. Um, if you don't have VS yet, it sounds like everybody does, but you can get it at aka.ms slash VS. Uh, and then there's some other links for, uh, for useful stuff to learn more about editor config or these kind of IDE features. Thanks very much, everybody. Uh, I'll hang out in the hallway if people want to ask me any questions. Uh, but I think I got to get out of here for the next speaker.